Okay, so we're going to talk about alopecia and other hair shaft disorders. To understand alopecia, you have to understand the normal hair follicle anatomy, and you have to understand the different phases of the hair follicle. We're going to talk about alopecia and include a discussion of the approach to the biopsy. We're going to look at non-inflammatory and inflammatory non-scarring alopecias, as well as scarring alopecias, which always have an inflammatory component, but depending on the time that you do the biopsy, you may not see a significant inflammatory component. We'll briefly mention the concepts of disorders of hair shaft and the different morphologies you can see with the hair shaft disorder. So let's start out with hair follicle anatomy. anatomy. You have to know what terminal hair follicles and vellus hair follicles are. So terminal hair follicles are long, thick bulbs located in the fat layer. So they reach all the way down to the fat. This is antigen hair follicle but you can have catagen and telogen hair follicles, which are still considered terminal hair follicles. Think of the classic terminal hair follicle as the thicker hair shaft surrounded by an outer root sheath and an inner root sheath going all the way down to the subcutaneous fat. Because most of the hair follicles in a normal skin biopsy of the scalp, for example, are going to have more antigen hair follicles than any other type of antigen hair follicle normally. So understanding how to identify an antigen hair follicle and a terminal hair follicle are going to be important in assessing the biopsy. In contrast, vellus hair follicles are short, thin bulbs in the upper dermis. The inner root sheath is actually more thick compared to the... Um, terminal hair follicles that are normally appearing in antigen or catagen or telogen. So hair, vellus hair follicles are gonna have a very small hair shaft diameter, and it's gonna be about the same thickness as the inner root sheath. And we'll take a look at some examples of that. <clears throat> the normal terminal to vellus hair ratio is seven to one approximately. So it's gonna be difficult to understand alopecia by looking at words on a slide. You really have to actually look at the hair follicles, gain practice in looking at different specimens and correlating it with the clinical picture to figure out the most classic ways that they're gonna test you on alopecia. So here's a cartoon to illustrate the terminal antigen hair follicle. I said it was an antigen hair follicle because its base is all the way down in the sub-Q fat. You can see that thick outer root sheath you can see um, the diameter of that hair shaft is quite thick compared to the inner root sheath. And looking on cross section, you really have to know where you're at on the skin. So if you see a cross section of, of a hair follicle, look around it and see, do you see any sebaceous structure, structures? Do you see any pilo um, <clears throat> erector muscles? Do you see sub Q fat? Do you see um, epidermis even around the hair follicle? This will give you an idea of how high or low you are in that cross section. You can also see though that vellus hair follicles have a much thinner hair shaft. It's actually on average thinner or about the same thickness as the inner root sheath. The outer root sheath is still present in a vellus hair follicle. Um, so think of a vellus hair follicle as just a, a small terminal antigen hair follicle. This is kind of a classic miniaturization um, of terminal hair follicles. So if someone says that they see miniaturized follicles, they're seeing a lot more vellus hairs than they are expecting to see in a normal scalp biopsy, for example. So androgenetic alopecia often has a increase in miniaturization of the follicles. It's not a scarring alopecia. However, it appears that they, that the scalp is bald because of the number of vellus hair follicles that are present. And you can see tiny little hairs on the scalp of someone who has um, full, you know, androgenetic alopecia. So keep in mind that the vellus hair follicle is a miniaturized version of the telogen hair follicle. Um, sorry, the vellus hair follicle is a miniaturized version of the terminal antigen hair follicle. 
you can kind of think of it like that. So in this um, picture here, you see that the inner root sheath, which the higher you go, the inner root sheath actually becomes fully squamatized. So you see this thick eosinophilic proteinaceous material is pretty small compared to where the hair shaft is there. Um, and then the outer root sheath is robust as well in a antigen terminal hair follicle. Depending on the level, you're going to see different thicknesses. And, you know, if, if you're cutting through the bulb, it's going to look different than if you're cutting through the mid shaft area. And then when you're cutting up by the sebaceous glands, the terminal hair, um, antigen compared to the vellus hair picture here, you can see that the inner root sheath is this thick here and the terminal hair follicle is smaller than that. So this thickness here is the inner root sheath, Henley's layer and Huxley's layer, and then this very thin miniaturized hair shaft. So if you see something in the superficial dermis where you're actually at the same level of the sebaceous gland, but it looks like a really tiny hair shaft and you see that thick inner root sheath, then you're going to know that this is probably a vellus hair. Continuing with discussion of like the normal anatomy of the hair follicle, you need to know the layers of the hair follicle. So oftentimes the exams will just point to a layer and ask you to identify it. So starting out, I like to think of it as starting out from the outer parts. We'll start at seven here. You can see the external fibrous layer. Then you go into the outer root sheath. If you're going to remember, if you're going to take away something from this lecture, remember that the outer root sheath is made up of a bunch of clear cells. And whenever I teach about trichelomomas, I like to ask about why are those clear cells there? And it's because the clear cells are programmed in a similar way to the outer root sheath cells. Um, and so you can even see a little bit of a thick eosinophilic membrane on the outside. That's where your clear cells come from in your, most of your trichelomoma tumors. As you move inward, you're going to start getting into the inner root sheath, which is composed of Henley's layer. That's first because HE is before uh, HU. So Henley going in from the outside, Henley, and then Huxley's layer. Then you're going to enter into the hair shaft and inner root sheath cuticle. So both the hair shaft in, uh, cuticle and the inner root sheath cuticle touch each other. So if you see a, an exam question, you need to put select the order that the cuticles are touching each other because it's the cuticle of the hair shaft and the cuticle of the inner root sheath touching each other. Then you move into the hair shaft cortex, which is the outside of the hair shaft, and then the inner part, which is called the medulla. You can notice the uh, amount of pigment granules that are present in the hair shaft as well. Um, so that can look interesting to people when you're not used to seeing it under the microscope. So don't be thrown off by that. Hair does have pigment. That's where you get your hair color from. Now to go over just some of the factoids here, medulla is not consistently present in humans. So you may see the hair shaft. It may be hard to identify two different layers. The cortex is thick and responsible for strength of hair shaft, and it consists of intermediate filaments of hard keratin arranged in microfibrils that intertwine to the, the macrofibrils. The cuticle consists of scales, and there's a companion layer between the Henley's layer and the outer root sheath. So if you go here to the Henley's layer and the outer root sheath, there's a little companion layer that's super, super thin and I don't really see that tested on frequently. Moving on to the layers of the hair follicle, uh, continued discussion of kind of how you're going to break it down when you're seeing different cross sections. So if you look, the layers change significantly depending on the, the level and the depth of the follicle. So you can imagine if you're taking cross sections higher up versus lower, look, look at the change of the outer root sheath thickness there. Right, So the ratio of outer root to inner root sheath thickness and hair follicle thickness changes as you, as you proceed down. Let's talk about the bulb of the hair follicle. So the bulb of the hair follicle 
is the that's where you're going to see the inner root sheath consisting of cells that actually have written nuclei. Okay. So the inner root sheath has nuclei here. You can see them. Um, as you go higher up, the inner root sheath actually loses those cells and those nuclei, and you just get this eosinophilic material there, if you can appreciate it where my arrow is pulling. See this transition. You'll also notice that the abrupt change from these keratinocytes, the outer root sheath, into this keratin, this compact keratin, it skips over something, it skips over the granular layer, right? So this is called tricholimal keratinization, okay? You have loss of the trichohyaline granules that you can see down here. And um, basically what happens is when you go straight from the outer root sheath into the keratinized protein, you lose the granular layer appearance. Um, and you lose the trichohyaline granule appearance. Okay. So the, you'll start picking that back up again, when you get higher in the epidermis, it's not shown here. Um, it, over on the, the photo on the right, you cannot see the uh, normal granular layer because we're still too low in the hair follicle. Okay. So also in the bulb, the outer root sheath has abundant glycogen. So you can see the abundant clear cell change throughout the outer root sheath. The Adamson's fringe, which is not in the photo on the left, is an area where you have the loss of trichohyaline granules and the nuclei of the inner root sheath and complete keratinization of the inner root sheath. So this is kind of the Adamson's fringe, Adamson fringe, because you see the keratohyaline granules disappear here and you just have a solid eosinophilic material. Okay. For the stem, that's where you have the cuticle and the inner root sheath undergoing trichohyaline keratinization. So you can think of that. It, it, if you've heard of a um, pilar cyst, then you're going to see the same pattern in a pilar cyst. And that's what separates a pilar cyst, or also known as an isthmus catagen cyst, but a pilar cyst from an epidermal inclusion cyst. An epidermal inclusion cyst is going to retain the granular layer on the outside and the keratin is going to be a lot more shredded wheat looking, or as we call kind of lamellated keratin. And the pilar cyst is going to have a lot more compact eosinophilic keratin. The bulge is defined as where the isthmus meets the stem. So the inner root sheath disappears at that area. So at some point, your inner root sheath is actually going to disappear and you're going to have, um, but it's not shown well in that cartoon, but the inner root sheath is going to disappear and it's replaced with just trichlemal keratin derived from the outer root sheath. Okay, so this is um, kind of the bulge area there. And the infundibulum is where the outer root sheath becomes continuous with the epidermis at the infundibulum. So it appears just like the normal epidermis. So you can see here that you have a, a thin granular layer close to where the, the hair follicle is. Okay. So in review, you've got the bulb, you've got the Adamson fringe. You have the cuticle or the inner root sheath where it undergoes trichohyaline keratinization. So that's the stem. The bulge where the isthmus meets the stem. So the bulge is just a meeting point. And in fact, um, stem cells are often located around this area. And infundibulum where the outer root sheath becomes continuous with the epidermis at the infundibulum, it appears like the epidermis. And if you look at the progression of these pictures, it, it would probably help you make more sense of it. So from the top here, you're starting at the lower part of the follicle. As you move up, okay, as you move up here, by the time you get to the top, you're gonna have a solid eosinophilic layer 
of the inner root sheath. And then you're starting to actually have a disappearance of that solidness. And then you are going to go into um, a granular layer containing area, okay? So you can see that the inner root sheath is the, the layer that can disappear here as you go further up. One more thing to point out is the dermal papilla here, which sits at the base of the, um, the bulb here. And it's kind of in that matrical area of the hair follicle. So the hair growth cycle is very important to understand as well. It's also about numbers and percentages. So the antigen phase approximately has about 84% of the hairs in a normal scalp biopsy are going to be antigen phase. So just by statistics alone, if you randomly picked a hair follicle, it's overwhelmingly likely it's going to be an antigen phase follicle in normal scalp. However, we don't biopsy normal scalp very often. So you're often going to see a, a shift and you might see only 60% of the hairs are in antigen phase. So if the question's asking about normal, then you should, you should know the numbers. However, most of the time when we're looking at a biopsy, it's going to be uh, altered. It's going to be altered. The phase of the hair follicles cycling, as well as the percentages of the hair follicles, the number of terminal hair follicles, the number of vellus hair. So understanding how it deviates from normal will be important to develop your differential diagnosis and meet the clinical picture of what's going on. So antigen phase, keep in mind, is about 84, 85% of the hairs. They're actively growing hairs. The hairs remain in antigen phase for about three years. And we, for this slide, we kind of constructed three, three, and three here to keep it kind of easier to remember. But you can have an antigen phase follicle that's two to six years, depending on, um, you know, the way that the hair follicles programmed to be cycling, genetic factors. And then also if you overlay pathology on it, those numbers can change. But when we're talking about normal hair follicle cycling, you can think about the antigen phase lasting several years. Now, how do you go from antigen phase to telogen phase? You have to go through your catagen phase, okay? And catagen phase, because it's a transition phase, it represents the smallest amount because when we, when we take a biopsy at a cross section of time, we're really only going to see a small percentage of those at that given time point. So catagen phase is your smallest percentage. It's about 2% of the hair at any given time in normal scalp. It's considered involuting hair. The hair is remaining catagen phase for about three weeks. Then you get to the telogen phase. The telogen phase represents about 14% of hair follicles. So 14, 15%. Um, if you add 84, 2, and 14, this will make 100%. However, it's going to be different depending on the person. But uh, if, you're, if you know that each cross section of a normal biopsy has about 25 to 30 hairs, then you can kind of work from there and say, okay, 10% of that would be two to three. Okay. So a little bit above that, maybe three to four would be in the telogen phase out of the total of the 30, right? You might get one of those in the catagen phase and the rest are going to be an antigen phase. So really um, catagen phase only takes about three weeks to complete. Then you have the telogen phase, which is the resting phase, and the hairs remain in telogen for about three months. And then after that three months, it cycles back into antigen phase. That's the normal cycle. So here's the cartoon to represent that. Antigen phase, 85% of the follicles are going to be in antigen phase normally. Patogen, about 1% to 2%. Telogen, about you know, 14%, 15%. Okay. And you can see that the dermal papilla is, um, again, now it should be down here in the, in the subcutaneous fat region, but if it's kind of involuting up and going into catagen, the bulb is going to start going up. You're going to be left with a Stella here or a fiber streamer. And then you're going to transition into the telogen phase, which if you were to pluck a telogen phase hair, you're going to see that it's got like this club shaped 
And you'll see on histology, it's, it's got this really eosinophilic base to the hair follicle that people liken to a flamethrower. You can see that as well in catagen, um, but telogen phase is more statistically um, able to be seen because it's a higher percentage of the hair follicles than catagen. In catagen, you'll see more apoptotic cells as the um, cells are kind of dying off here and regressing. And then once you get to this point where you're going to start cycling back into the antigen phase again, you're going to lose, lose the telogen hair. So telogen effluvium is when all of your, not all of your hair, but when more percentage of your hair goes into a uh, more of a telogen phase state. And so you're losing more hair. So you have a shift from antigen to telogen. Now, if you do a biopsy on telogen effluvium, depending on how severe it is, you may still see that most of the antigen hair follicles are there compared to the raw number of telogen hair follicles, but the increase, the ratio. So instead of 85% to 15%, you're going to have maybe 60 to 40%. So an increase in the number of telogen hairs are, is going to result in more shedding, if that makes sense. Just another image here of the papillary mesenchymal body or the dermal papilla, the bulb on the outside here, the inner root sheath, as you can see here, and the outer root sheath of an antigen hair follicle. You can also see an adjacent hair follicle over here where you see the outer root sheath as well. And then over here to the right was the same picture that we already looked at. So you can see the thick outer root sheath. You can see that fully keratinized inner root sheath in the stem area. You see the Adamson's fringe. Here you see um, where the loss of cratohyaline granules occur. And you see the bulge, which is the transition zone from the stem to the um, portion where the cratohyaline um, and trichelomal keratinization occur. Just another image of a cross section of that inner root sheath and the outer root sheath. So what is a catagen hair follicle? Catagen hair follicle is a transition phase follicle. So as I mentioned before, the catagen phase is going to be here. You're going to start regressing and the base of the matrix is going to be moving up. And you're not going to see this normal antigen hair follicle appearance in catagen, right? So um, you're going to lose the uh, Adams and the clear Adamson's fringe type areas that you see so prominently here, where you have the loss of the um, uh, the trichohyaline granules. Here, you're going to start seeing a lot more apoptotic bodies occurring in the hair follicle itself. Um, so let's look at some examples of a catagen hair follicle here. So a catagen hair follicle is a shrunken bulb and you're not going to start, you're really not going to see much mitotic activity in the cells surrounding the hair follicle. You're going to have a shrunken bulb and you're going to have a separation from the dermal hair papilla. So you're going to actually have the hair follicle separate from this structure here, the dermal papilla, when you start getting into a catagen phase. So here you don't see that dermal papilla anymore, right? So it's, it's starting to involute and come up upward. That lower portion is involuting via apoptosis. It's becoming a thin cord surrounded by what we call wrinkled folds. So the tissue itself is just not as sturdy and it doesn't have as much structure as the healthy looking antigen hair follicle. You can see in this picture, it illustrates very nicely the carado, um, sorry, the uh, apoptotic bodies, the apoptotic keratinocytes rather here. So these really hot pink to red cytoplasmic cells, 
those represent apoptotic cells. And so that's going to result in regression of all of this epithelium here. And, you know, you, you really just see this abrupt transition into, um, you see this abrupt transition, trichohyalin um, loss, and you see the tricholimal keratinization. So pilar cysts are also known as isthmus catagen cysts, and it's kind of for this reason here. Because isthmus catagen cyst, you often see the same type of tricholimal keratinization pattern when you look in a pilar cyst. And you see the, the epithelium here is super uh, pink looking, and then it just transitions into a very compact <clears throat> keratin. So cross-section, you can kind of appreciate some scattered apoptotic bodies as well. And then you might liken this to a flamethrower appearance, which is often associated with telogen phase. However, you can still see this um, type of flamethrower looking appearance in a catagen hair follicle because it's in a portion of the follicle where you're having mostly the uh, isthmus, um, at the level of isthmus, you're having this trichlinal keratinization. And then the telogen hair follicle represents thin epithelial cords, which retract along the papilla. It's the lowest portion at the level of the erector pili. The hair is surrounded by outer root sheath and inner root sheath is no longer apparent. So again, think about a telogen hair follicle losing the inner root sheath. Why is that? Because you're already high up. You're already, I'm skipping back here to to kind of point out here, when you lose your inner root sheath, you're at the level of the bulge. So the telogen hairs are that high. Okay. So they're, they're really high. Um, you can't really see kind of where they're at because they're so far high. You can't um, fully appreciate where the bulge is here because the um, inner root sheath completely disappears at the level of the bulge. And I kind of think of that as where you have like your sebaceous glands and your um, erector pili muscle kind of inserting in. So you'll see some of those areas on cross section up here at the level of the bulge. But if you see something that looks like the base of a follicle on cross section, then you're dealing with a telogen hair follicle. So you can see how high this is, right? This is a pretty high telogen follicle. So you can see that it, it looks like the base of the hair follicle is already right there. You don't really have any inner root sheath at all. Also another cross section, you can see you're in the dermis and there's no inner root sheath whatsoever here. It's even hard to appreciate where the hair shaft is. All right. So again, looking at the level of the cross section, you can compare the level of the base of antigen and catagen as well as telogen. So if we cut kind of in the same cross section area here, you can appreciate, for example, a large outer root sheath here and some inner root sheath, right? And then as you start getting up to the level of the bulge, which is right here, okay? then you're going to see the actual epithelium bulging and you're going to see um, erector pili kind of connecting in that area. If you look where this is cut in cross section, you'll be able to capture some of that flamethrower, hot red pink appearance. And you don't really have um, this point depending on the level of the cut, you can't really see the stella here. And so that's going to be illustrated more in this right panel. Over here in the telogen um, pictures here, they're going to show you the cross section at the base, which I told you, you can't really see the hair follicle here because it's cut in the, I mean, what, not the hair follicle, the hair shaft. So you can't really see the hair shaft here because it's above the level of the plane. But you do see some hair follicle epithelium. 
So this is your very base of the telogen, right? It looks so much different than your bulb region of an antigen hair follicle. So if you see this, it's going to be a telogen follicle. And what's your percentage that you're going to see? About 15%, right? Or about three to five hair follicles in a normal biopsy. And then here, uh, you kind of see this loose stroma where the keratinocytes used to live. And now you just have this kind of loose, empty dermal tissue. Uh, maybe has some vascular structures here, but it's just some um, loose fibrovascular connective tissue that looks different than the rest of the dermis. And this is a Stella or a fiber streamer. So any, any uh, pathology that makes you shift from your antigen to your catagen slash telogen phase, and that ratio gets bigger, that is going to be um, a hallmark many times of the non-scarring alopecias, because it's really just a change in the ratios of expression of antigen to catagen and telogen. So how are you going to approach the alopecia biopsy? You're going to look at the number of hairs. You're going to try to figure out the terminal and vellus. If you're in a horizontal section, you can see uh, 25 to 30 or so. Um, hair follicles, and in a vertical section, you can see um, usually around five to nine, depending on the section. However, I've seen even 10 or more in a normal scalp biopsy full, just packed full of antigen hair follicles. Now, when a biopsy is performed, usually it's because there's alopecia. So it's going to be difficult to always you know, see a healthy number of terminal hair follicles in general. So just keep that in mind. The number of hairs that you're going to look at are going to mostly be antigen. Most of them are going to be antigen. And so you're going to get close to 30, probably anywhere between 20 and 30 of those hair follicles are going to be antigen. Two to four, maybe even three to five of those will be telogen and maybe one Patogen you might catch in your biopsy. Uh, we often just tend to kind of simplify and think of it as antigen to telogen ratio, because again, you're, that's the largest percentage population of follicles that you're usually dealing with. You're going to want to look at the status of the sebaceous glands and their rectal pili muscles, the status of the epidermis. So don't just focus on the, the hair follicle number, but look at the entire tissue and, and get a sense of what's going on. And the abnormalities, what can cause alopecia? So of course, inflammation, but what kind of inflammation? Is it lymphocytic? Is it neutrophilic? Is it um, mixed? Do you see areas of scarring? Do you see mucin deposition? Do you see organisms? And could this be an infection? Sometimes malignancy and malignant infiltration of the scalp can cause alopecia. So there's a lot of different things that can cause alopecia. And the reason alopecia can be so difficult is because you really have to couple the clinical picture with the pathology and uh, rely, those will rely on each other even more heavily than most entities in dermatopathology. However, for teaching purposes, you have to start with kind of learning the classic presentations, and then you can start to see more real world examples of things that deviate from classic. You can also have scarring alopecias and a background of non-scarring alopecias. That's very, very common. So we'll kind of get into some of the specifics of that. Just a word about special stains that are often used in alopecia. So for alopecia special stains, you can do a PAS, that highlights fungus, but it can also highlight the basement membrane. You can do PAS diastase as well, just to um, kind of enhance visualization of uh, non-dissolvable glycogen as well. Um, I like to do PA, PAS fungus to enhance and make sure that there's no fungal elements there, but you're going to be able to see the basement membrane in a PAS stain. You can look for thickening of the PAS or thickening of the PAS signal corresponding to basement membrane. And that is going to give you an idea about possible connective tissue disease. 
GMS stain will highlight fungal elements. It highlights a lot of things. It's a silver stain and it can be pretty dirty, but when you see the fungal hyphae, you'll be able to pick up on that um, and be able to rule out some type of tinea capitis, for example, causing alopecia. You can do a gram stain to look for bacteria, an elastic or Verhoff van Giesen stain and Movat stain. Those are both elastic, elastic stains. And elastic stains can be um, helpful to look for loss of elastic stain and scars and just kind of help you visualize a true scarring alopecia. Colloidal iron with and without digestion will help you confirm increased mucin stain. If you have increased mucin within an alopecia biopsy, you should be considering an autoimmune connective tissue disease. So as I said, there can be some significant overlap. And so there's, there's going to be a transition oftentimes from inflammatory process to end stage scarring. But when you're looking at just statistically um, where you're going to find most of these diagnoses, it's going to be in either the non-scarring or the scarring realm. But to get to scarring, you have to have follicular dropout. And so if you biopsy an early scarring alopecia, it may um, give some features of early entities like early discoid, early lichen plano pilaris, for example, um, evolving frontofibrosing alopecia, things like that. So just keep in mind that the time point, if you biopsy some area that looks like a burnt out scar, then you can really only say scarring alopecia. If you biopsy an area that appears to be actively inflamed, then you can localize the inflammation to where it's at, the type of inflammation, and gives an idea of what it could be evolving to. So the non-scarring entities include telogen or antigen effluvium. You're not really going to see much inflammation in these. Alopecia areata, you'll see mostly lymphocytic inflammation at the bulb, but it doesn't destroy the hair follicle. It just stimulates an antigen to telogen shift. So these, um, patients do not have scarring and they can regrow their hair once the inflammation dies down. Their telogen phase follicles can re-enter into antigen phase. Androgenetic alopecia, unless there is a folliculitis component there um, or some other type of uh, superimposed inflammatory process on the background of androgenetic alopecia, you're not going to usually see much inflammation. Trichotillomania and traction alopecia can mechanically evolve into a scarred alopecia because of the mechanical forces and the damage that's happening to the hair follicle itself and the microenvironment of the hair follicle. Your classic scarring alopecias include discoid lupus, lichen plana pilaris, pseudopalad of Bruck, dissecting cellulitis of the scalp, acne keloidalis, and folliculitis to cal. So let's address the non-inflammatory alopecia. Androgenetic alopecia is the result of polygenic inheritance of increased type 2 5-alpha reductase and androgen receptors. It leads to the potentiation of the effects of dihydrotestosterone on scalp follicles, and that leads to shortened antigen cycles and gradual hair miniaturization. 50% of men by age 50 have androgenetic alopecia. 40% of women by age 70 have some form of androgenetic alopecia. There are the male pattern and the female pattern androgenetic alopecias. So male pattern, typically you have frontal recession with bitemporal recession and mid scalp and vertex loss. There is a Hamilton Norwood classification that kind of breaks down different progressions of male pattern. Female pattern usually presents as a symmetric Christmas tree pattern of thinning across the midline of the vertex with sparing of the frontal hairline. And that's typically broken down into a Ludwig classification. So here you see androgenetic alopecia in a male. You can see the bitemporal and frontal thinning, the vertex thinning as well. And you can see the... Um, Hamilton Norwood classification, which kind of shows you um, 
an example of type one here, which is just mild frontal um, regression, type two, which goes more, and then type three, which is even more, and you've got some vertex loss as well. And type four, it's just a progression along those lines of the frontal and the vertex. Type five, it's starting to coalesce more. Type six is even more. Um, type four, type five, we're not, we're not illustrating type six here. It goes from type five to type seven, but you get the picture. It's just progressing and you're getting more areas of involvement. Female androgenetic alopecia, and this is a, a more severe example, but uh, thinning likely started out in the central part in the vertex and then just kind of spread outwards. So you can see um, based on the classification here, the Ludwig classification of the three types, these are just cartoon examples of that. So you can see type one is starting in the vertex of the scalp and then progressing through. And I will say that this is more in the central vertex, whereas the male pattern hair loss starts a little bit shifted backwards oftentimes, and even in the between the occipital and the <clears throat> temporal and parietal uh, intersections. So androgenetic alopecia, you're going to see a normal or near near normal number of hair follicles. You'll be able to visualize miniaturized antigen follicles and the variability in the follicle diameter. You'll also notice that the sebaceous glands appear relatively large, especially compared to the shrinking hair follicle. You'll see a decreased antigen to telogen ratio. And again, that's because you're not only seeing that shift from antigen to telogen, but you're also going to see increase in vellus hair follicles. So you'll see miniaturization, both in the form of vellus hair population, and then the telogen um, hair will look smaller as well because it's higher up and it's regressed upwards. You'll be able to see some fibrous tracks as well because you have that shift from antigen to telogen. So to orient yourself on cross-section, if you find the fat, then you know, okay, I'm in the fat, I know that I'm looking mostly at essentially antigen hair follicles because they're able to get down to the fat. So if your normal biopsy has about 25 to 30 or so hair follicles and you count here and you say, okay, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 an hour. So you already know that the antigen hair follicle population has shifted dramatically. And if you look at the other levels here, so you're, this is the level where you're coming out of the fat and into the dermis because you start to see that there's some areas of dermis here and you're losing some of that fat. You have maybe a little bit of an increase here. There's some small diameter follicles, as you see. And then when you get up to the um, higher level here at the sebaceous, you can see the the level of the sebaceous glands are here, so you know you're higher up in the in the um, biopsy. Look how many hair follicles you have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So you have about 30 here, right? So there's no decrease in the number of hair follicles, but there is a drastic change in the ratio so you have only 12 down here and you've got 30 total hair follicles. So that means that, you know, some of these are going to be antigen hair follicles, but if you've only got 18, if you've only got 12 antigen down here, then that means that you can do a math and say maybe 18, 17, 16 of these are either vellus or telogen. So that tells you that there's a dramatic shift from normal and you have a lot more miniaturized follicles and you have a lot more telogen follicles. So you can see the small hair shaft here that's miniaturized. And then you see some areas where it looks like you just have outer root sheath perhaps. Um, so you might have 
And then at the level of the sebaceous gland, maybe you haven't gotten to the area yet where you lose the inner root sheath. So you might see some thick eosinophilic areas, but this is enough for you to say, okay, if the clinician is suspecting androgenetic, I had miniaturization, I've got a normal preservation of terminal hair follicles. So yes, I think it could be androgenetic alopecia based on clinical uh, suspicion as well. Okay. So you can see the miniaturized follicles here. You see these examples. Um, the vellus hairs often, if you're at the level of sebaceous glands and you see a, a nice clear outer root sheath and you see an inner root sheath that the thickness of this eosinophilic cuticle is about as thick as these small hair shafts, then you know you're dealing with a vellus hair. Um, here, it looks to be about the normal um, thickness of a hair. So this is uh, this could be an antigen hair follicle. Um, it could be a telogen hair follicle. It's a little unclear, but um, again, you have to look at the cross section to kind of get an idea. We don't really know how far down this one extends because we're only looking at cross sections. So that's why it's important to look at your numbers on, on different levels and see kind of what makes sense. Now the sebaceous glands are not destroyed. In fact, they look pretty good and pretty healthy. Um, and if you think about a lot of androgenetic alopecias are based on high levels of androgens and high levels of androgens often correlate with increased sebaceous activity. So you can think about the sebaceous glands are happy and healthy in this environment. Follicular stella are um, kind of those vascular, fibrovascular leftover areas where the antigen hair follicle used to be, but now it's gone. So you see that there's just these remnants. Uh, they're kind of like tracks or footprints in the snow, if you will, of the antigen hair follicles. Just some more pictures of the follicular stella. So looking more at miniaturized follicles, I told you that they kind of look like little antigens in a way, but um, you see that the these follicles do not have as thick of a presence as a normal antigen hair follicle, which you would like to see a lot thicker, a lot deeper here. And so these are the presence of more miniaturized follicles on vertical section. Now, I will point out that cross-section can give you information that vertical section can't. And that's because if you drew a line, for example, let's say you bisected this biopsy. On this section, you might catch, you might catch one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, seven, depending on the um, section. If the hairs are angled, you might catch more. So that's why we say five, six, seven, even up to eight, nine, 10, depending on if you section it in an orientation, you're catching more hair. So you might see if you cut it here and you're looking vertically, you might see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, depending on the uh, plane of section you're looking at. So cross section can give you kind of more of a bird's eye view information about the density of the hair follicles that the traditional vertical section cannot give you, but you also are going to um, be able to look at the other bisected half and you can cut deepers in different sections and be able to kind of get an idea, uh, depending on if you're looking at vertical or horizontal sections, you should still be able to make the diagnosis, but you just have to look at the different distributions and patterns. Okay. Moving on to telogen effluvium. So telogen effluvium is often induced by stress. And um, there could be a numerous different causes of stress. It could be uh, mental or physical stress. It can be trauma, surgery. It could be related to a medical uh, syndrome or disease that the patient is undergoing. It could be a drug or vitamin deficiency. So Typically, depending on how long it's been since the telogen effluvium has been present, if it's less than six months duration, it's considered acute telogen effluvium. Typically, this is an external stressor that happens about three months before hair loss. 
In chronic telogen effluvium is if this is happening greater than six months in duration, usually idiopathic or due to a medical disease, drug, or iron vitamin deficiency. The results in, um, I mean, the telogen effluvium results in early end to antigen phase. So you have a premature exit from the antigen phase into the catagen slash telogen phase. You have diffuse thinning of the scalp hair sometimes with bitemporal recession. You can do a hair pull test where you're going to take about 10 or about 20 to 30 hairs and you're going to put some gentle traction on it. And you might get two to three hairs normally, but if you get five or more hairs in general, um, if you get what you think is to about greater than 10% of the, the hair that you grab comes out easily, then that is a positive hair pull test. And that essentially means that there's a greater expected ratio of hairs in telogen phase, indicating telogen effluvium. But you can get the history pretty easily too, because the patients are saying, look, I'm losing more hair in the shower. I'm losing more hair um, just in general. And so you're going to be able to tell based on history as well. And telogen effluvium results in diffuse thinning of the hair. But when you actually look and if you use dermoscopy and look at the follicular ostea, you're going to see a maintenance of the density of the follicular ostea. And it's not going to have a scarred looking appearance. But sometimes clinically, it can be difficult to tell. And so that's why we will do our biopsies. As I said, the hair pull test is where you take 20 to 30 hairs between the fingers and you gently pull. Usually you only will obtain telogen hairs and usually 10% of, uh, less than 10% will be okay and greater than 10% will be more of a positive pull test in general. Down here, you can see just a normal light microscopy showing you the club shaped of a telogen hair follicle as opposed to the shape of an antigen hair follicle here. Telogen effluvium is usually a clinical diagnosis and it's, it's biopsied less than scarring alopecia because clinically it doesn't look like scarring and the patient um, is saying that there was a stressful event or, you know, they're able to trace it back to a shift in medical uh, status or something of that nature. And we will be able to make the diagnosis of telogen effluvium based on clinical. However, telogen effluvium can definitely coexist in a background of androgenetic alopecia. So um, you probably have both of those going on and just calling something suspecting uh, androgenetic alopecia, maybe with a component of chronic telogen effluvium without doing a biopsy. If you start patients on treatment empirically and they improve, then um, you kind of have your answer. But to really get a sense of what we're dealing with, especially if the patient is uh, experiencing progression, then doing a biopsy can be extremely helpful. So in telogen effluvium, you're going to have, remember, a normal follicle size and the number of the terminal hair follicles in total are going to still be preserved because it's not a scarring alopecia. However, you will have an increase in the telogen to catagen presence compared to the antigen follicle. So the increase in that ratio. Inversely, you can think of it as a decrease in the antigen to telogen. It's just a shift. So here you see a cross section of an antigen hair follicle and a cross section of a telogen hair follicle. You can see again, um, that kind of hot pink flamethrower look appearance to this area. You can imagine that this, you're already um, looking at the inner root sheath here on the antigen hair follicle and the outer root sheath. And you can see how thick that hair shaft would be over here. You don't even see a, an actual healthy hair shaft. It's more of just this kind of amorphous keratin material. So you know that this is likely high up, um, that the base of this follicle is pretty high. Here you can see terminal um, or terminal hair follicles, but of the telogen phase, telogen germinal units. And if you look at this, it's kind of peripherally palisading, like almost like a basal cell would. Um, it stains very blue. 
Oftentimes, if you do a burrup force stain in these little terminal uh, telogen germinal units, you'll find some positive burrup force staining here. Um, but you see that these are pretty high up in the dermis. So this is your telogen phase. And then here on cross section, you see this kind of um, irregular border epithelium that represents telogen phase keratinocytes. So what about trichotillomania? So trichotillomania is the compulsion to pull hairs out and it results in hair loss. So patients unfortunately pull up the hair in their scalp, their eyebrows and lashes, even the pubic region. The pattern can be pretty variable and it can be isolated or it can involve entire areas, entire scalp. Um, the hair growth window technique may be useful. So essentially um, just kind of monitoring how the hair is changing over time, getting a really good clinical history. These patients are often going to have a negative hair pull test. And that means that um, they're not, you know, they don't have a shift from antigen to telogen. It's really more about them actually plucking out antigen hair follicles mostly is what they're plucking out. So you can see this patchy hair loss here where the patient's pulling on their hair frequently. Here's some more obvious um, loss of hair. So with trichotillomania in the early stages, you can have normal size and number of the hair follicles. Usually you're gonna have many catagen and telogen follicles with apoptotic keratinocytes as um, the plucking uh, phenomenon kind of changes the architecture of the cell surrounding. Um, where the antigen hair follicle uh, and the hair shaft used to be. And so it's going to kind of cycle through. Usually you'll see melanin cast within the follicular canal, and that's going to be helpful to, to see a picture. So I'll skip ahead just to show you this trichomalacia and this increase in melanin pigment. This very irregular distorted hair shaft here is what you're going to see in trichotillium, trichotillomania that's more advanced. So trichomalacia. You can see um, that the melanin casts are going to be very prominent in advanced trichomalacia. You're going to see that distorted, small, and incompletely keratinized hair follicle with the uneven walls. You're going to see some perifollicular hemorrhage. And oftentimes you won't see inflammation here. Um, you can, but you oftentimes it won't induce a severe immune response or inflammatory response. So that can be helpful as well. Now, it's possible to see some apoptotic keratinocytes in the epithelium and um, trichotillomania, but really it's the, the pigment cast that you're going to want to look for. You might see some catagen hairs here and there, but the classic uh, test example is going to want to show you pigment cast so that way you can pick up on trichotillomania. These are also classic pictures for you. So um, if you see this, this is from Elson's textbook, then think about trichotillomania. You can note that there's not a lot of inflammation here. So what about traction alopecia? It's kind of related to that, but it's not really more of a behavioral constant picking at the hair. It's more of a mechanical friction that's placed on the hair by uh, tight hairstyles. So this is hair loss due to application of tensile forces to the hair, which could be due to excessive brushing, or hair weaves, tight braiding, ponytails or pigtails, buns, cornrows, wearing elastic hair bands, et cetera. It's reversible in the beginning, but if it's very chronic, then it can actually lead to long-standing ischemia, follicular dropout, and scarring. And so um, identifying it early as possible and telling the patients that um, although you may not be a you, you're a hair expert, but you may not be a hair style expert, um, but nevertheless it's important to um, release the tension on the hair and give yourself a chance to maintain a good blood flow, good supply, less stress and tensile forces on the hair follicle itself to allow the chance for preservation as, of as many hair follicles as possible in that area. But unfortunately, it can if it's long standing, it can become permanent and result in scarring alopecia if the traction is intense and if it's sustained. So here's a good example of traction alopecia. You can see the, the tight hairstyle 
Um, it's pulled on the hair for so long that they've actually lost the hair follicles, the hair growth here. Traction alopecia has very similar histology like trichotillomania. And again, it makes sense because you've got uh, tensile forces on the hair itself causing trichomalacia, distortion, irregular borders of the hair follicle and follicular ostea, and development of pigment casts as well. You can see a cross section here of damaged inner root sheath follicle. So if you see really irregular looking inner root sheath, really irregular looking cuticle, um, you definitely need to think about some component of uh, trichotillomania and alopecia caused by behavioral issues such as constant picking at the scalp. Looking at inflammatory non-scarring alopecia. So when we're thinking about inflammatory non-scarring alopecia, you're going to want to think about um, the possibility of an autoimmune etiology such as alopecia areata. So when we talk about autoimmunity, oftentimes we think about autoimmune connective tissue disease, but alopecia areata is an inflammatory non-scarring alopecia. Luckily, the immune system does not permanently destroy the hair follicle. Um, and that's kind of the nature of the definition of alopecia areata. So you have normal inner root sheath. Uh, and so just normally speaking, the inner root sheath and matrix do not express MHC class one and two antigens that allows the immune system to essentially ignore the hair um, and not attack it. But in androgenetic alopecia, unfortunately, there's induction of MHC class one antigens, which allows inflammatory reaction to follicular antigens and epitopes, which are usually hidden and go um, just kind of under the radar of the immune system. So this antigen presentation, this abnormal antigen presentation leads to activation and response of the lymphocyte to antigen presenting cells with migration of activated inflammatory cells and infiltration of hair follicles. This leads to damage to the hair follicle by the inflammatory cell infiltrate, leading to premature antigen arrest and involution. In alopecia areata, you'll see rounded patches of complete loss with sparing of gray hair. Alopecia totalis is when it involves the entire scalp. Alopecia universalis is the entire scalp plus the body hair. And diffuse alopecia areata just means diffuse thinning of the hair scalp, of the scalp hair. So for you dermoscopy fans out there, what are you going to see on dermoscopy? You'll see yellow dots, which are dilated in fundibula with keratin and sebum. You can see black dots, which are remnants of broken tapered hairs and exclamation mark hairs, which represent short terminal hairs with narrowing at the scalp attachment. So here is an example of the uh, clinical presentation of alopecia areata. You see this really well demarcated area of non-scarring alopecia. You see this annular non-inflammatory foci of alopecia. It can be inflamed. But remember where the inflammation is. The inflammation is mostly in the bulb of the hair follicle. So it attacks the bulb of the hair follicle and induces a shift from antigen to catagen and telogen. You can see here the typical exclamation mark or exclamation point hair. So they actually get thinner as you get closer to the surface of the scalp and they break very easily. And this is because over time you had normal thick hair, but then as the inflammation happened, it started to cause a thinner uh, development of a thinner hair shaft. So this is the time you can see the, the change in the inflammation based on time. And you can see uh, over here, this light microscopy image showing you the exclamation point appearance. You can even have loss of the eyelash hair, which is shown here. You can see the eyebrows have also thin. Here's an example of alopecia universalis, where the patient also had loss of body hair, but um, here you just see the scalp. So if it was just the scalp, it would be totalis. 
So what are you going to see on histology? You're going to see peribulbar lymphocytic inflammatory infiltrate, which looks like a swarm of bees around the hive. That's kind of the classic catchphrase. You'll see a decreased antigen to telogen ratio with increase in the catagen hairs. Again, that's because it's attacking and inducing that shift, right? So you will have a higher chance to see catagen hairs and antigen and alopecia areata because you're going to be often seeing that inflammation inducing the development of the uh, catagen. You're going to see more fibrous streamers as well, but you may not even see a lot of in, uh, inflammation in kind of a alopecia areata that doesn't have as much of the classic inflammation based on maybe the evolution of the clinical. So when you do the biopsy, all you may see is just this kind of shift from antigen to catagen telogen, but with an overall preservation of the number of hair follicles. Look for those fibrous tracks. So you'll see lymphocytes, maybe some eosinophils and some uh, melanophages within macrophages or uh, melanin within macrophages rather, or melanophages within fibrous tracts. You'll want to look for dilated infundibula containing keratin and sebum. And then you might see advanced uh, cases of where you have more follicular miniaturization. So here you see some really nice examples in cross-section of the lymphocytes around the bulb. You can see the swarm of bees appearance here. <laughs> And then after the bulb kind of regresses higher up into the skin, it'll leave behind follicular stella, which are still infiltrated by lymphocytes in many cases. But you see this just kind of collected fibrovascular stroma-like material here. And you can see the surrounding subcutaneous fat. So it's kind of the footprint in the snow of the antigen hair follicle. Late stage alopecia areata is not going to have as much inflammation anymore. And what you're really going to see is an increase above the normal catagen to telogen follicle to antigen ratio. So you're going to have more fibrous streamers. You're going to have a loss of true antigen follicles. You're going to see this shift. So you see a lot more Stella down here in the... Uh, see evidence of Stella here at the transition zone between the sub-Q and the dermis. So you can see that there's a preservation of the overall number still, but the thickness of them are, are much less. You don't see the actual hair shaft in many of these. Um, so you know that the hair follicle material is still there and it's shifted from antigen to into a catagen, telogen type phase but you don't have as much inflammation. So this might be all you see depending on when you take the biopsy and where you take the biopsy of patients with alopecia areata. Here's just a, a high image example of alopecia areata, but focused on the follicular stella here. So you see sparse inflammatory infiltrate with numerous melanophages also in there. This chart's for reference, just as a comparison between alopecia areata, pa pattern alopecia, and trichotillomania. So this is from Dr. Elson's textbook, and you can compare and contrast alopecia areata and to look at the fact that there's a lot of things that alopecia areata has that the pattern alopecia or trichotillomania don't have. Particularly, if you look at the miniaturization aspect, you'll see that Trichotillium mania usually does not have evidence of miniaturization, whereas alopecia areata can. The antigen to telogen ratio is usually decreased in alopecia areata and pattern alopecia. <clears throat> it can be variable in trichotillomania. Of course, you're going to see more fibrous track remnants in alopecia areata and pattern alopecia compared to trichotillomania. For catagen hairs, you're going to see that they're pretty common in alopecia areata because you're having that transition. You can see that in trichotillomania as well, but it's pretty rare in pattern alopecia. In pigment, uh, or looking at pigment and hair canal, pigment and fibrous tracts, lymphocytes around the bulb, lymphocytes in the fibrous tracts, and eosinophils in the fibrous tracts, it's all very common in alopecia areata. 
but the latter four parameters are not very common in pattern alopecia or trichotillomania. So don't forget we said infection can cause alopecia and syphilis is a great example of that. So syphilitic alopecia, you can think of it as two groups, symptomatic syphilitic alopecia, where you have associated, it's associated with other manifestations of secondary syphilis. But essential syphilitic alopecia is where you show no other features of secondary syphilis, and you really need a high degree of suspicion in, in order to achieve it. So if I see alopecia that looks patchy, has a moth-eaten appearance, and a relatively healthy young person that's just complaining of abrupt onset, I often will consider getting an RPR because um, if it's positive and they didn't, they've never been treated for syphilis, then that would be an easy way to recover. And there have been plenty of patients that um, once treated for syphilis have regrown their hair back to normal. As you would expect, the hair pull test can show increase in telogen and hairs in the affected areas. Here's an example of syphilitic alopecia. You see that typical moth-eaten pattern of alopecia. Again, just more um, examples of that, but even with scaling and hair loss. On biopsy, you can see psoriasiform hyperplasia of the epidermis, spongiosis and exocytosis of neutrophils, and focal interface change with hydropic or vacuolar degeneration of basal cells. You can see superficial and deep perivascular and periadnexal lymphohistocytic inflammatory infiltrate with a variable number of plasma cells. So we often tend to think that the classic syphilis has a lot of plasma cells, but you may not see a ton of plasma cells. If the clinician is wanting to rule out syphilis, then I will often get a immunohistochemical stain against the organism. So treponemal immunohistochemistry, because that's better than other stains like worth and starry, et cetera. And in those cases where you don't have a lot of plasma cells, it's good to be able to just say that you did the stain and that you ruled it out for the clinician. Of course, um, the stain being negative doesn't always mean that it's not related to syphilis. So um, you have to uh, correlate clinically and do an RPR if you're wondering about syphilis. If you have lots of plasma cells in the sample and the clinical scenario fits for syphilis, but the stain is negative, then you should still do an RPR and just correlate clinically. Maybe some other type of serologic test to look for syphilis, VDRL, et cetera. So here's an example of syphilitic alopecia on biopsy. So you can see follicular destruction, intense inflammatory inflammation. Oftentimes syphilis not only has plasma cells, but it even has lots of neutrophils as well as lymphocytes and histiocytes. So very mixed inflammatory picture here. The immunohistochemical stain will highlight these spiral organisms that are reflective of positive staining for the spirochete organism, tryponemal organism. Okay, moving on to cicatricial or scarring alopecia. So this table summarizes various types of scarring alopecia. You can break it up into lymphocytic scarring, neutrophilic scarring, and mixed scarring. Start out with autoimmune connective tissue disease, lupus, erythematosus, particularly discoid lupus. So 30 to 50% of patients with discoid lupus will present with scalp involvement. They'll, pre they'll present with erythema and atrophy as well as follicular plugging and modeled hyper and hypopigmentation. Patients with systemic lupus may also have short miniaturized lupus hairs on the anterior scalp. Here you see some discoid lupus. Here you've got the scale, follicular plugging, and scarring alopecia. In lupus, you'll have a lymphoid infiltrate with interface change at the level of the isthmus. The DIF will uh, ideally show a full house along the follicular basement membrane. It doesn't always, but that's the uh, test answer for you is that it will show a full house of IgG, IgA, IgM. Um, and C3 along the basement membrane, so-called lupus band. Other features of lupus include interface change, hyperkeratosis with that follicular plugging, thickened basement membrane, 
perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic inflammation and increased dermal mucin. In the early phase, you'll see perifollicular mucinous fibrosis and some focal interface change. But as you progress, you'll start to see diffuse dermal scarring and loss of elastic fibers as well. So here's more of an active discoid lupus picture. You see um, hyperkeratosis, you see follicular plugging, you see thickening in the basement membrane, but you also see destruction of the epidermal keratinocytes via a vacuolar interface type change. And you will notice superficial and deep perivascular and peri follicular as well as periecrine inflammation. Now you can even see from this power increased blue material within the spaces of the collagen fibers. It almost looks as blue as ink that you would have the tissue margins marked or something, but it's actually increased mucin, which we'll show you. So here you can appreciate that thick eosinophilic material, that's where your thick basement membrane is, but you also see some areas of keratinocyte apoptosis, abundant vacuolar change. So you've got this interface reaction as well as thickening of the basement membrane. And then here you see abundant interstitial dermal mucin. Lichen plano pilaris is kind of one of my favorite alopecias to look at under the microscope in the active inflammatory phase. So it occurs in all types of patients, but uh, you'll frequently see it in adult women. That's the most common demographic, but half all have these patients also have lichen planus, not surprisingly, because lichen plano pilaris is essentially a lichen planus type reaction in, around the scalp hair follicles. The vertex and the parietal scalp are favored in lichen plano pilaris. If you see a band-like area on the frontal scalp, loss of eyebrows, things like that, you can think about frontal fibrosing alopecia. LPP, as we abbreviate it, has variable clinical course resulting in patchy areas of hair loss accompanied by follicular inflammation. So you can actually see in the most active inflammatory phase, this perifollicular scale around erythema that's surrounding the hair shaft when you're looking down on the scalp. Now, lichen plano pilaris can be asymptomatic, but it can also be itchy, painful, and burning. And that makes sense because you're going to have inflammation. As you progress in a late stage, it becomes more obviously a scarring alopecia where you have loss of follicular ostea. You have um, wedge-shaped fibrosis replacing the area where the follicles used to be and loss of normal structures like sebaceous glands and eccrine glands. So on the exam, I said that you'll see perifollicular erythema with scale as well as small follicular keratotic papules. You may see tufted folliculitis where you have several shafts exiting a dilated ostium. You can see that in other entities as well, like folliculitis to calvins. And you may see progressive scarring with loss of follicular orifices, depending on how longstanding the process has been. So this is obviously a much more advanced area of lichen plana pilaris. You see an actual a trophic patch with loss of the follicular orifices. So you don't see those holes anymore. You can see though, uh, in the hairs that are still present, this perifollicular scaling and maybe some erythema as well. It's considered a lymphocytic scarring alopecia because the inflammatory infiltrates predominantly lymphocytes and they're present at the level of the infundibulum um, centered around the infundibulum, but they can be around the isthmus as well. Lichenoid interface dermatitis with hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, and sawtooth reedy ridges. If that reminds you of lichen planus, it's because those is, that's also what you see in lichen planus. But it's focused on the follicular epithelium here in lichen plano pilaris. It has relative sparing of the intervening epidermis, interestingly. So the entire fibrous tract remnant that's left over may be filled with dyskeratotic keratinocytes, depending on what stage you obtain the biopsy. And you may see wedge-shaped scars on elastic stains as well. What do you see on direct immunofluorescence for this? Now, it's not required, obviously, to make the diagnosis, but if you do a DIF, 
you'll see shaggy fibrinogen and cytoid bodies in the basement membrane zone. And if that sounds familiar, that's what you would see in lichen planus as well on direct immunofluorescence. So as expected with progression, you're going to have destruction of the follicular sebaceous units and, and naked hair shaft granulomas as well. Ultimately, a scar is going to form in the place of the follicle. So here you see this kind of lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate coursing along and around the follicle, as I said, at the level of the infundibulum, but also it can be at the level of the isthmus. And you've got this obscuring of where the end of the follicular epithelium ends and the dermis begins. So that's your classic lichenoid inflammatory infiltrate here surrounding the follicle. Now, depending on how robust the inflammation is, when the biopsy is done, where the biopsy is done, you may see this, or you may just see complete scarring depending on the area that was selected for biopsy. So you really have to know, did the clinician biopsy this in an area that they felt was more actively inflamed? Um, because that's going to change how you're going to interpret the follicular numbers or the follicle numbers, et cetera. But I find that biopsying more inflammatory areas is going to be helpful to give you an idea on if you're dealing with the lymphocytic alopecia or not, because um, you may be dealing with some more neutrophilic alopecia, or you may be dealing with a non-inflammatory type process. So it's um, when you biopsy area that still has hair follicles, but you think there's inflammation there, that that's going to be the most helpful. And you can do always consider doing two biopsies, one in like a more inflamed area and one in a uh, even more hairless area just to see, is it truly scarring or is it just very miniaturized hair follicles? So here um, from Dr. Elson's textbook, you see a nice example of lichenoid interface dermatitis around the follicle, some areas of sawtooth reedy ridges, uh, hyperkeratosis, hypergranulosis, band like infiltrate. This essentially is a lichen planus uh, picture as well. You can see fibrous tracts filled with savat bodies in the areas where the hair follicles used to be. And you can see necrotic keratinocytes within the area of the epithelium at the interface level. Just the same, you can see necrotic keratinocytes in lichen planus as well. Here's a table just to summarize some differences between discoid lupus and lichen planus pylorus. So they have in common that they both have hyperkeratosis and interface dermatitis, but in discoid, you're going to have mostly vacuolar with some intermittent lichenoid, whereas with lichen plant by large, you're going to have a lot more lichenoid. You'll see more pigment incontinence in discoid lupus and lichen plant by laris. You'll see that the lymphoid infiltrate, although it can be present in both the infundibulum and isthmus in both of these entities, it's more centered at the isthmus and discoid lupus. And in lichen plantar pilaris, it's more centered at the infundibulum. You're going to see that the basement membrane zone is more thick in discoid lupus, whereas in lichen plantar pilaris, because the basement membrane is being attacked, you won't see that thickening as much as you will see in a discoid lupus. Dermal mucin is going to be collected more in discoid lupus. So if you see high levels of mucin, you definitely should be thinking of a discoid lupus autoimmune connective tissue type picture. Whereas um, if you see mainly lymphocytes in the ec around eccrine coil, you, you should think about periadnexal and think about a discoid lupus. You will not often see periecrine inflammation in lichen planar pilaris. You can see a lupus paniculitis type reaction in discoid lupus because again, it's autoimmune. Whereas in lichen planar pilaris, the fat is relatively spared. Direct immunofluorescence, as I said, you'll find a more of a full house picture in discoid lupus. And with lichen planar pylorus, you'll find just mainly negative uh, antibody signals, but you'll have shaggy fibrin and cytoid bodies. And then the scars that you're going to find in discoid lupus, the scars are going to be more diffuse and throughout the dermis in discoid lupus, but in lichen planar pylorus, you'll have more of a superficial wedge type scarring pattern. Moving on to central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, or as it's often referred to uh, in short, CCCA, it's a hair loss that begins at the vertex and progresses centrifugally. In advanced stages, you're going to have the actual loss of follicular ostea, and you can even see some tufting. Here's a clinical picture of CCCA at the vertex of the scalp. 
in a patient with type probably four uh, Fitzpatrick skin type. Histopathologically, you can look for clues if you're trying to separate lichen planum pilaris versus CCCA. So in CCCA, you're going to want to see that desquamation of inner root sheath happens below the isthmus. So you'll see here in this left side image, um, you'll have this premature desquamation of the inner root sheath at the level below the isthmus. You can even see fusion of remaining hair follicles, as you see in this picture, perifollicular concentric fibroplasia around the fusion of the hair follicles. So depending on what stage you biopsy it, you may not see any hair follicles. It may just be complete scarred dermis, but um, if you biopsy it in a more actively inflamed area, you're probably still going to see uh, lymphocytic inflammation around the isthmus. It's usually centered lower than LPP. So if you see that and the clinical looks like CCCA, then you can sign it as a lymphocytic scarring alopecia and say that you favor CCCA versus LPP. If you see the fusion of those remaining follicles, it should also help you prefer CCCA over LPP as well as desquamation of the inner root sheath, that would also make you favor CCCA. But ultimately, if you get a late stage scarring alopecia, you're not gonna be able to separate out LPP versus CCCA. <clears throat> so what about folliculitis to Calvin's? With folliculitis to Calvin's, it's more of a neutrophilic inflammatory alopecia. So you'll see crops of follicle-based pustules that coalesce. They will often grow staph aureus as well, and that's why these patients get good response with doxycycline or other antibiotics. They present in a different way. It's, it's more follicular uh, pustule-based clinically, and it's more painful, uh, frankly, for these patients as opposed to more itchy or sensitive or burning. It's actually just more painful. Um, they have more of a pyogenic inflammatory state, so that often is associated with more pain. The vertex and the occipital scalp are the most affected. You can see this kind of um, boggy appearance that you might even consider like a dissecting cellulitis here, but it uh, looks like there's this honey-colored, almost impetogenized crusting around follicles that appear to have numerous follicles exiting the scalp in a similar area, kind of this tufted folliculitis appearance. So this is your classic folliculitis to Calvin's picture here. You can see the late phase is not as uh, crusted or inflamed anymore, but you're just left with large areas of scar. Folliculitis to Calvin's in its early phase, as you can imagine, is more separative and more neutrophilic folliculitis. And as it evolves, you start to get loss of the hair follicle epithelium, but you still have this retained naked hair shaft protein material surrounded by granulomous inflammation and reactive plasma histiocytic inflammation. You'll see destruction of the sebaceous glands, you'll see wedge-shaped dermal scars, and you'll see the polytrichia that we mentioned there, the tufted follicle. So here you see the fusion of the follicles in some areas here. Um, they're kind of converging on, on one another and they're exiting in the similar area. These are mostly uh, neutrophils here. You can see some naked hair follicle areas where there's no epithelium around it, just the actual um, naked follicular shaft there. And you can see here <clears throat> free hair shafts without the epithelial covering, as I mentioned, sometimes depending on the section, you might just find like a little circular or like a spherical object within the dermis that is a hair, but nothing else around it. Maybe some granulomous inflammation around that. A related entity is acne keloidalis. You're going to find papules and pustules in the occipital scalp and the back of the neck. Progresses to more exophytic keloidal plaques with alopecia. So clinically, this is uh, pretty easy to get the diagnosis. It's on the back of the neck and or on the base of the occipital scalp. And you've got these scarred papules around the follicles here. So acne keloidalis. Early stages, you'll have intrafollicular pustules, so it is more of a neutrophilic inflammatory process, and later you get more follicular rupture with hair shaft granuloma formation and scarring. So in this picture, it's just kind of showing you the loss of the follicular units here. It's more of a scarred papule. And related to that, hydroadenitis separativa mainly affects the apocrine areas, the axilla, the groin, 
where you, the patients often have chronic recurrent abscesses, draining sinuses, and scarring. The etiology is hyperkeratosis of the follicle, which leads to occlusion of apocrine glands, follicular rupture, and introduction of keratin and bacteria into the dermis. Then it transitions into abscess and sinus tract formation. So it's a difficult condition in dermatology, and uh, there's a lot of interest among um, you know, even medical students who are interested in going into dermatology, particularly fourth-year medical students, have a high level of interest in this condition. So you can see here the hydradenitis operativa within the axilla. This is a pretty um, advanced, probably early stage three, um, because you've got obvious tract formation, lots of draining, et cetera. Very painful for these patients. And um, we often end up putting them on uh, doxycycline and or clindamycin rifampin, try to calm things down and bridge them to uh, anti-TNF therapies like Humira. Uh, sometimes you can consider getting surgery for these patients if you have a conversation with the surgeons, but it all just depends on the patient preference on how they want to go about trying to treat their disease. At the end of the day, removing the uh, troublesome apocrine glands, removing the, the tracts and preventing uh, them to even have the template to develop this, uh, this type of inflammatory process. Now, the reason it's in the uh, alopecia section is because it can lead to scarring and hair loss in that manner as well. But it has a lot of similarities because um, hydradenous separativa often does correspond with occlusion triad where you've got, you know, um, acne conglobata, you've got hydradenitis separativa, you can have dissecting cellulitis. Um, oftentimes these things will run together. So a biopsy would show separative folliculitis with abscess formation around naked hair shafts, granulation tissue, and sinus tract formation with separative and granulomous inflammation. Here you see a hair fiber with separative inflammation. So like I said, you can just see, you could even see this in uh, like a acne keloidalis or dissecting cellulitis or a folliculitis to Calvin's, depending on when you biopsy. But you see this kind of naked hair shaft here surrounded by a dense granulation tissue. Briefly finishing up with disease of the hair shaft, it's important to know that you can have fractures of the hair shaft, irregularities of the hair shaft, hair shaft coiling and twisting, and even extraneous matter on the hair shaft which can all um, ultimately result in changes of hair growth appearance and appear even as like an alopecia, um, but it could just be a hair shaft disorder. So here you can see the different patterns for reference. Um, I would study these different patterns. Trichorexis and vaginata looks kind of like um, people say like a, a golf tee on another golf tee. Um, you can have a tapered Part of the hair shaft resulting in a tapered fracture. You can have trichorexis nodosa, which looks kind of like these brushes uh, clashing up together. You can have this uh, trichoptilosis, which kind of has this like brush like appearance. Monolethrix, which has more of a beaded appearance. Trichoclasis, which has a kind of a, it's like a fracture in the middle of the hair shaft. Trichoschesis, or just clean breakage peripylar casting, trichonodosis, pili torti, which is like a twisted hair shaft, pili multigemini, where you've got um, this kind of U-shaped and then branching into two separate hair shafts. And then you can have variations of this pili or pili bifurcati. So here's pili bifurcati here, and then you can have pili bi bifurcati and pili multi bi bifurcati. So you need to know that there are some hair disorders which have specific appearances. So as I just mentioned, the monolethrix has that beaded appearance. Pili torti has the twisted appearance. Trichorexis and vaginata has the bamboo appearance. Trichorexis nodosa has an appearance of two paintbrushes and thrust together. Alopecia areata has an exclamation mark appearance. Loose antigen syndrome has a rumpled sock appearance. And trichorexis and vaginata has the golf tee appearance here. 
So this is, is for your reference. I won't read the entire table, but it is important to be able to know that there's a gene a mutation behind each one of these different diseases. So it is worth memorizing this because you could have some questions on your core exam or your final exam where you would need to know that there's a mutation leading to the phenotype. So the high yield ones are listed here. So just know, for example, um, SPINK5 is associated with Netherton syndrome, and that's where you're going to see that bamboo hair defect. Um, know, for example, the hairless gene that's associated with generalized atrichia with papular lesions. You should know that the um, glycoglobin mutation is associated with Naxos disease, results in woolly hair, and you can also see sparse and woolly hair when you have um, mutations in uh, Carva, uh, in uh, desmoplakin, which leads to Carvajal disease, which is listed on another slide here. You can see ATP7A mutations leading to Menke's disease. That's a copper transporting ATPase, and that leads to hair loss as well. TRPS1 is associated with trichorhinal phalangeal syndrome 1, so trichorhinal phalangeal TRP syndrome. That can also lead to sparse and unruly scalp hair. Um, so amopamol binding protein here, uh, also this long name of delta-8, delta-7 sterile isomerase amopamol binding protein, just abbreviated EBP, is associated with excellent dominant chondrodysplasia punctata, and that leads with coarse hair and alopecia. So just get a sense of the different types of mutations and how they're associated with these different diseases when you're studying for your pediatric dermatology core, because um, these are these are definitely important to know. And don't forget um, IKK gamma or NEMO here. We often think of that as uh, the gene behind incontinentia pigmenti, but it's also associated with an ectodermal dysplasia phenotype. So uh, this is the last slide here. Just to summarize the pili you can see Twisted hair in Mankey's, Bjornstadt, Crandall, Bazek, and citrullinemia. Trichonorexis nodosa, you'll usually find that in, well, you can find it in many different entities, but classically in arginosuccinic aciduria. The trichorexis imbaginata, you're going to classically find in Netherton's woolly hair presentation, you'll find in Naxos and Carvajal. And remember, Naxos is placoglobin, Carvajal is desmoplakin. Band-like um, kind of tiger-striped appearance you can find in trichothiodystrophy. And in large pigment granules, you can find in some subtypes of Grishelli syndrome and Chediakaigashi syndrome. These are pretty complex diseases, and uh, I recommend you to really study your pediatric dermatology review sections because they often go over these in detail, as well as um, Bologna textbooks and other textbooks will, will go into a deeper discussion on these genodermatoses. Eventually, I will do a lecture over various genodermatoses and post it here on the channel, but for the purposes of this lecture, we will not go into depth on that. So um, just to summarize here, alopecia is a difficult topic, and you really need to know... Um, have a basic understanding of the different hair cycles, the basic understanding of the way that the follicles are going to look at different cross sections and different planes of section and how to correlate that with what you're seeing um, clinically. But if you're only tasked to make the diagnosis based on cross sections or vertical sections, you should have a basic idea of what types of inflammation you're seeing and at what level you're seeing it. If you see a biopsy that has preserved numbers up to 30, then you know you're probably dealing with a uh, non-scarring alopecia. If it's preserved numbers, but it's actively inflamed, based on the location, you can think that it's the very early stages of a, of a potentially scarring alopecia. So um, alopecia is a challenge, but you just have to practice and do um, multiple practice questions and cases and um, delve into your textbooks and uh, you know, if you don't understand something, then ask your der dermatopathology mentors or your dermatology mentors to help try to demystify it for you. All right. Well, thank you for your attention.